So we've been going through a series in the book of the books of First and Second Samuel, looking at, we call it after God's heart, the life of David. And what we've seen throughout this story, we've seen how God has made David to be a, God, a, a man after his own heart. And so this morning we're going to consider what it kind of looks like to have right intentions, but sometimes wrong, we do things the wrong way. So let me just tell you a, a funny story that I found online this week. A man bought a brand new BMW right off the lot, took it home, and was very excited to show his family. His five-year-old son was the one that was the most excited when he saw this car, and he wanted everyone to know how proud he was of his dad for this purchase and how he wanted everyone else to know whose car that was. And so the little boy found a rock, and he crawled on top of the hood, and he wrote on the car, on the hood of this brand new BMW, Dad's car. You see, the boy had good intentions, but of course, the father was not very happy about this. But he had all the good intentions of the world. His, his heart was in a good place to let everyone know how proud he is of his dad and how this is his dad's car. This is nobody else's car. And that this can happen even to us. And there is a common phrase in our culture that says, the road to hell is paved with good intentions. Right? This happens all the time. There can be major unintended and negative consequences to, de to decisions that we make be with good intentions. Because good intentions aren't always what's needed in order to actually do the right things. And despite any good intentions we might have, when it comes to our relationship with God, it is essential that we approach God in worship and prayer with the right attitude and with a life of obedience. And so today we're going to consider how we can pair good intentions with right approaches. We're going to look at four approaches when connected with good intentions to worship God and fellowship with him will lead to a greater understanding of who he is and a great and a deeper relationship with him. So to summarize it all, it's going, we are going to learn how we must learn to approach God according to his word, healthily fear his holiness, rejoice in his character, and align our priorities with his. So I invite you to turn to 2 Samuel chapter 6 in your Bibles. If you need a Bible, there's a brown hardcover back in the seat in front of you. Turn to page 305. And while you're doing that, I'm going to give some background. So what has happened now in the flow of the story, David now has full control of the kingdom of Israel. He had had only partial control for the last seven years before this. And now he wants to bring the Ark of the Covenant, which was a symbol of God's presence. He wants to bring it into their new capital city of Jerusalem. And so when he, when he does this, he, there's a couple reasons he's doing this. One, he wants to put God at the very religious center of the nation so that they're saying God is the focus of our people. This is what they did in the wilderness years during the, when they had the tabernacle and they would travel. They would put the ark in the middle with the tabernacle in the middle of the camp of people and they'd all be facing towards the center. The other reason he wants to do this is because Right now, the ark, and, and where we're at in this story, the ark is on the outskirts of the country and is very vulnerable to Philistine attack. And David has just attacked the Philistines and defeated them twice. So there's a little bit of a fear of reprisal. And so David is now saying, okay, let's move this thing into a more central location, a safer place. But the Ark of the Covenant itself, it was this three and three quarter foot by two and a quarter foot by two and a quarter foot box that held major significance within it. And, and, and symbolism as well. It was viewed as God's footstool, meaning he was the true king of Israel, no matter who, what human king was in place. It also symbolized God's reconciliation with his people, how he brought them into a relationship with him. It also symbolized how God revealed himself to his people by putting the Ten Commandments inside of the box. But also it was this place that Moses met with God inside the tabernacle. And so the Raiders of the, Lark, uh, Raiders of the Lost Ark movie, the Indiana Jones movie, makes this mistake as if the Ark itself is the thing that is powerful. It's not. It's not the, the thing that is powerful. It just showed how God pledged himself to the people of Israel and that truly God must be the, at the center of everything that the nation of Israel is going to do from this point forward. But there were certain protocols when it came to moving it, and we're gonna see how David ignores every single one of them. First, it's no touching, no looking, and no 
cart. And we'll see how they break all of those. But the reason that they had these rules is because the ark symbolized the very presence of God. And it would be like trying to walk into the presence of God unclean without having gone through ritual protocols to make yourself clean, but also having, while you're in the middle of your own sin, to walk in front of God and say, hey, what's up? I'm here. Which was a big no-no. It was not something they were supposed to do. They were supposed, because of sin, they were supposed to cleanse themselves. And so looking at it, touching it, and putting it on a cart was basically like saying they're going to boldly just walk into the presence of God without having been cleansed of their sin. And so that's what's important about this story. Let's go ahead and begin. We're going to read verses 1 through 7 to start. David again brought together all the able young men of Israel, 30,000. He and all his men went to Baalah in Judah to bring up from there the ark of God, which is called by the name, the name of the Lord Almighty, who is enthroned between the cherubim on the ark. They set the ark of God on a new cart and brought it from the house of Abinadab, which was on the hill. Uzzah and Ahio, sons of Abinadab, were guiding the new cart with the ark of God on it. And Ahio was walking in front of it. David and all Israel were celebrating with all their might before the Lord, with castanets, harps, lyres, timbrels, sistrums, and cymbals. When they came to the threshing floor of Nacon, Uzzah reached out and took hold of the ark of God because the oxen stumbled. The Lord's anger burned against Uzzah because of his irreverent act. Therefore, God struck him down and he died there beside the ark of God. So again, David is moving the ark, one of the reasons is a political reason, to move it safely from the outskirt of the country into the middle. And that's why he sends 30,000. It seems like overkill, but he's doing that to make sure that the ark is absolutely safe. And there's this great pomp and circumstance, this big parade of celebration of this ark now coming in, celebrating God as who he is, being faithful to take care of the nation that he has provided this nation for them to be in. And the ark had now actually been separated from a tabernacle type dwelling for a hundred years. It had been a long time. And so what you see here is by describing the ark that the way the author does here, he's basically saying, look, the ark is one thing and God is another thing. You cannot make, you cannot say that the ark is God himself. It symbolizes his presence. It represents that God is among, it wants to live and dwell among his people. But as you can see from the picture, the way that the story describes does not follow that protocol. You can see that it's covered. You can see that there, and you actually can't see them in this picture, but they attached gold rings to the corners of it, of the ark, so they could stick these poles on it, and then they would hoist it onto their shoulders, and it was by specific people. These were Levites. It was their job to do this. Now, the unfortunate thing in this story is that Uzzah and Ahio are two of these Levites. They should have known the rules and they didn't. They should have known. These are very clear in Numbers 3 and 4, but also as well, David should have known. David's directive to put it on a new cart was something as basically to say, I am showing respect to this object. It was with good intentions, but it was ultimately not the correct way to do things because it wasn't showing reverence to God. And so this is why we must seek to look to God's word for what proper worship looks like, what, what we need to be doing, even if there are good intentions behind practices that we might have while we're here, because there are massive consequences if we don't. At the very least, someone could be distracted from their faith in Christ or become more confused. People aren't going to literally keel over and die from something that we do here this morning, but at the very worst, someone could be deceived and be pulled away from a real relationship with Jesus Christ. And this is something that I think Micah does a phenomenal job with, with our music, with, a, with the way he orders services. Everything is intentional to try and focus on what does God's word tell us to do. And, that's, and he's very intentional about the lyrics he picks too for songs that we sing. And so this occasion, there was tons of celebration, but then suddenly it turns quickly as soon as Uzzah reaches out to touch the ark. Now, here's what I think happened. I don't think the ark was falling and it was like this dramatic movie moment, you know, like Mission Impossible where he almost touches the ground, right? Di like he had to dive and just barely got it back up. I think what happened is the oxen just tripped a little bit and he freaked out and just reached out his hand to keep it safe. Remember the rules, no touching, no looking, no cart. What this was, even though this might seem harsh, 
This showed that Uzzah was trying to take the place of God to take care of this ark. He was also taking the place of God and trying to say, I can approach God, I can come before God even while I am in an unclean state, a, a state of sin. And so what he actually is doing here, this is a, a law that was in the Old Testament that basically said, if you touch the ark, you, it is punishable by death. And only, the only person who could touch the, the ark was the high priest. The only one. But he had to go through a series of rituals to make himself um, physically clean, ritually clean, and spiritually clean before he could actually touch the ark. And it was one guy once a year who could do that. And so God also had graciously warned them and told them about this and warned them saying, these are the rules, this is what it is, please follow them. But God also being a holy and just God had to follow through when he said it is punishable by death. And so even though Uzzah's intention was not wicked, it was not evil, it was not something that he was trying to, he had good intentions trying to protect that thing, but he needed to remember there are numerous times throughout the story of the Bible where God protected his ark, took care of it. So Uzzah took the place of God, and so his actions actually showed an irreverence towards the holiness of God. So this is actually our first approach this morning, is that we must come to God in the ways that he has laid out for us in his word. Sometimes as Christians, we, we forget to approach God as this holy and perfect and righteous God, and we just think of him as this personal and loving God, which he absolutely is, but because of our sin, because of the state and condition that we are in, we are, uh, it is, we, it is, God is absolutely unapproachable because of our sin. And so David put these men in a very disadvantaged situation by not having them follow the protocols. And so when we come to worship God, when we come to, even just to live our lives, we must recognize that we are living and worshiping a real, holy, and somewhat fearful God that we need to have. And it's why our lyrics need to be accurate. It's why our worship order service needs to be as such that we don't distract or try to manipulate an emotional reaction out of people because what we want is a worshipful attitude. But the number one way that God has laid out in his word that we can come to him is the ultimate story of what we believe as Christians, the gospel. Is that when Jesus died on our behalf on the cross, that he now paved a way for us to be able to have access to God, to come before God because he has washed us completely clean of our sin. Because there is no amount of any good deeds that we can do that could measure up, that could allow for us to stand in the presence of God because we all have sin in every single one of us. We need him to make us clean enough so that we can approach him in his holiness. And so this is the first thing. Approach God in, the, in a way, in the ways that he has laid out for us in his word. Remember, we are not saved by those things, but that shows that we live in obedience and that we respect and fear God. Let's continue, verse eight. Then David was angry because the Lord's wrath had broken out against Uzzah. And to this day, that place is called Perez Uzzah. David was afraid of the Lord that day and said, how can the ark of the Lord ever come to me? He was not willing to take the ark of the Lord to be with him in the city of David. Instead, he took it to the house of Obed-Edom, the Gittite. The ark of the Lord remained in the house of Obed-Edom, the Gittite, for three months. And the Lord blessed him and his entire household. And so again, David's intentions were noble, Ultimately, though, they were incorrect. And we see that David is angry. And ang anger is a pretty complicated emotion. So it's very possible that he had multiple things he was angry about. Might have been angry at himself for not directing them correctly, looking at God's word. And so he's upset with himself, costing another man's life. He might have been upset with Uzzah, knowing that he was a Levite and should have known. But he also could have been upset with God because man, God, why are you being so harsh? He could be thinking something like that. God, this doesn't seem fair. But David's next reaction is the one that's the most important. It says that he f was afraid of the Lord. And what this did is this actually led him to have a greater respect for God. The book of Proverbs says this, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. To have a true wisdom of how life is supposed to be, it begins with fearing the Lord. And what we mean by fear is having an awe, having a respect for God in his perfect holiness. And that when we truly fear God, it changes the way that we act. 
We can't stay the same. And so some of us, if we're continually struggling with things that we haven't seemed to be able to beat, maybe it's because we don't quite fear God enough. We need to recognize that he is a perfect and holy and righteous and just God who must address evil in every single one of us. But there's a whole thing, we'll talk about that in a minute. But as a result of his fear, David is saying, I'm not bringing that ark anywhere near me. I'm a, I am terrified of that thing. But then it's taken to Obed-Edom, the Gittite, and he is blessed. And we don't know what the blessing is, but it's obvious. And so Dale Ralph Davis, who is one of the um, authors I read to prepare for this week, this is what he said when it comes to the fear of God. You dare not trifle with a God who is both real and holy. Yahweh is not your neat, warm, fuzzy friend in the sky. Yes, we can become friends with God by his grace, by coming to a relationship with him, but we still must fear and respect the fact that he ultimately is a holy God. And so this is our second approach, is that we must have a healthy fear of God's holiness especially when it comes to worship. Worship is not about the feeling that we receive, but a fearing of the Lord leading to a holy life. We must fear God. And I'm not sitting here saying something like, all, for those of us who are, are Christians should be you know, shaking in our boots every time we come into this room, but it's to have absolute respect for who he is. Because remember, it might seem harsh that Uzzah was killed, but it, reve- it reminds us that God is an absolutely holy and perfect God, and that alone should give us some fear. Because sometimes what we do is we sometimes justify little small things. Oh, that was just, that was just a little white lie. That wasn't that big a deal. Oh, I just fudged the numbers a tiny bit on my taxes. No big deal. But they are a big deal because James says in his book that if you are guilty of just one sin, you are guilty of all of it and you are unrighteous before God and unable to approach him and have a relationship with him. But for those of us who are in Christ, this is very important for us to balance this idea because we are told that we don't, we no longer need to be afraid of God, to be, to fear the Lord in terms of this total terrified feeling because Christ absorbed our punishment of God's wrath against sin for us. He absorbed it when he was on the cross. But we still must fear the Lord in showing him great reverence in the way that we approach him and recognize that his total total holiness makes him unapproachable if if it wasn't for the work that Jesus did for us. Dale Ralph Davis says as well, and Yahweh's people tend to forget what sort of God they face. We forget that there is heat in his holiness. No, we do not need to be terrified, but being scared wouldn't hurt. And he's making a, a clear statement here. Sometimes we think of God as that warm, fuzzy friend, and we forget that he is a holy God and that there is an amount of fear that we should have. I heard uh, the Bible Project guys call God's holiness, they compared it to the sun. You don't want to just, you're not going to just waltz on up to the sun, right? You'll die, you'll burn. And so this is, you don't just waltz on up to God because you'll, (laughs) in in your sin, because you will die. But as Christians, here's something else that Paul says in Philippians 2. He says, to work out your salvation with fear and trembling, for it is God who is the one that works and wills in your life. We must recognize that God sometimes in our lives will bring about situations as Christians in order to root out sin and evil from our lives. And that should leave us a little bit in a, in a fearful state to recognize that God might bring about situations. He might allow natural consequences to reach their end so that we can realize that we need to walk away from a certain sin. He might let us get a DUI if we have a drinking problem. He might let us lose a job because we've been dishonest in that job. Or if we've been having an affair or have a secret addiction, he might just allow that to be exposed. And he does that for Christians, for our good, so that that would no longer be an issue in our life, so that those things can be taken care of. But we can fear that God will work in that way and that's why we must seek to live with a healthy fear in mind recognizing that yes we don't have to worry about the ending judgment because we are made right with God but that God sometimes will allow things to happen in our lives because he wants to root out things that don't make us like him let's continue verse 12 
Now King David was told, the Lord has blessed the household of Obed-Edom and everything he has because of the ark of God. So David went to bring up the ark of God from the house of Obed-Edom to the city of David with rejoicing. When those who were carrying the ark of the Lord had taken six steps, he sacrificed a bull and a fattened calf. Wearing a linen ephod, David was dancing before the Lord with all his might, while he and all Israel were bringing up the ark of the Lord with shouts and, and the sound of trumpets. As the ark of the Lord was entering the city of David, Michal, daughter of Saul, watched from a window. And when she saw David leaping and dancing before the Lord, she despised him in her heart. They brought the ark of the Lord and set it in its place inside the tent that David had pitched for it. And David sacrificed burnt offerings and fellowship offerings before the Lord. After he had finished sacrificing the burnt offerings and fellowship offerings, he blessed the people in the name of the Lord Almighty. Then he gave a loaf of bread, a cake of dates, and a cake of raisins to each person in the whole crowd of Israelites, both men and women, and all the people went to their home. So again, this blessing that comes onto Obed-Edom is evident. And so now David actually gets a picture that, oh, this is what could happen if we transport the ark correctly, that there could be joy, that there could be blessing for the nation of Israel. And it shows how that, that God's prerogative actually truly is to bless his people, not to bring curses on them. What he did with Uzzah is not his prerogative, but something he must do because he is a holy God. And we can see from verse 13, that David now is going to follow the proper protocols to transport the ark. We actually see that in 1 Chronicles 15, 11 through 15. It just, it's a parallel of this passage of this story that it describes that they did it exactly how they were supposed to. They covered it in the curtains from the tabernacle so that nobody would look at it. They put the carrying poles through the rings and hoisted on the shoulders of the Levites so that nobody would touch it. They did it right this time. And what this re results in is now worship and celebration and joy. But David does something else here that's very interesting. He puts on priestly garments. And what this actually symbolizes is that he is humbling himself to become like the form of a servant. And we see this happen with Jesus. Paul talks about this in Philippians 2. Jesus took on the form of a servant. And what Peter or what David is doing here is he's laying he's laying aside his kingly garments and putting on his priestly garments to show one, that he is not above the people, but that he is a king over a kingdom of priests. And so David's worship and celebration here shows that he learned a very valuable and important lesson here. Sincerity and enthusiasm for the Lord are not enough when it comes to worshiping or knowing or approaching God. As we discussed before, it also takes an attitude of reverence for God displayed by a life of obedience to his commands. And when we see verse 16, it talks about McCall, the daughter of Saul. We're going to talk about her in the next section. So hold that thought for a second. But they now bring the ark successfully into the city of Jerusalem and they offer sacrifices basically saying, we are totally committed, totally devoted to the Lord. We want to see, and we're, they're rejoicing and, and saying, we're, we want to claim the blessings of the Lord that he has bestowed upon us by the fact that we are committing ourselves to him. And David displays God's character and blessing by blessing others and giving out food to all the people. And so this leads us to our third approach is that we can rejoice greatly because of God's mercy and goodness. When we approach God correctly, as, especially for those of us as Christians with the blood of Jesus covering our sins completely, washing us clean, when we live a life, a, a reverent life uh, before God, we can be free to worship and know God and pray to God with incredible joy. Over my years of ministry, I've talked with people who, who will say to me, you know, I just, I, I'm just not an emotional person. I'm not, I, I just don't express myself in worship. I just don't express myself. I don't feel the joy. But then I'll be, I've been at their house and watch them watching their favorite sports team on TV and it's a completely different thing. They're yelling, they're screaming, they're, they're excited. And I'm not saying that everyone should be kind of lifting their arms and celebrating while we're here, but I'm saying that you can be free to worship God with joy because of who he is and what he has done. And we must remember that the Apostle John says something very, very important for us. He says that perfect love casts out fear. The perfect love of God should cast out fear because the gospel is clear. Christ took on all the wrath of God against sin on our behalf on the cross so that if we put our faith in Jesus, 
There is no more wrath towards us. That is the greatest joy that we should think of, how we have, there is no more wrath towards us because of sin in our lives, that, God, that, our, that the punishment has been taken care of and that we can now boldly and confidently approach the throne of God without any sort of fear whatsoever. The writer of Hebrews says, let us then approach God's throne of grace with confidence so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help us in our time of need. And what the author of Hebrews is talking about at that time specifically is that Jesus is our great high priest who has experienced everything that it means to be human, every temptation, every weakness, and yet he was without sin. And so because of that, we can now approach God in confidence when we believe in Jesus. And we can rejoice, rejoice in a relationship with God because we have seen how good, how great, how loving, how merciful, how gracious he really is and that this is his prerogative, the way that he would rather act than to act in the way of bringing punishment and judgment. Let's continue, last section, verse 20. When David returned home to bless his household, Michal, daughter of Saul, came out to meet him and said, how the king of Israel has distinguished himself today, going around half naked in full view of the slave girls of his servants as any vulgar fellow would. David said to Michal, it was before the Lord who chose me rather than your father or anyone from his house when he appointed me ruler over the Lord's people Israel. I will celebrate before the Lord. I will become even more undignified than this, and I will be humiliated in my own eyes. But by these slave girls you spoke of, I will be held in honor. And Michal, daughter of Saul, had no children to the day of her death. So we're going to take a look at a character profile here of Michal, the daughter of Saul. From verse 16, we see that her response seems to be somewhat jaded. She might be somewhat jaded towards God and towards David as the anointed king of Israel. Because here's kind of her story, why she might be jaded. She was at one point infatuated with David. She loved him. But that was because he was this great and powerful warrior, this successful warrior while her father was king. And her father sought to press an advantage against David by having the two of them get married. And so to me, that already spells doom for the marriage right from the beginning, that this wasn't maybe the best way to bring the two together. But she also could have resented David because he forced her to come back to her after he returned. See, when David ran from Saul and hid from him, for, had to hide from him for 10 years and, and you know, escaped to all different locations. McCall was given to another man in marriage. And so when David returned and David was safe again, he brought her back and the man that she married followed her, wanted to be with her because he was in grief that he was losing his wife and that David was taking her back. She could have resented him for that. But she also had showed previously how she wasn't necessarily concerned about the things of God because she had her own household idol in her home that she worshiped. And so we're seeing parts of it here where she's not so godly of a woman, but she's also been through some pretty hard things in her life. But we see her true character here. She seems to be most upset with David for taking off the kingly clothes, putting them aside and putting on the priestly clothes, that this was above a king. This is not something that he should do. And so like her father Saul, she seems to care more about status and visually looking the part rather than having a heart that's after God. And she seemed to not be able to accept the divine purpose of God that David was now the king and not anybody from her family and that she was not okay with what God was doing and now was actively working against God's purposes by discouraging the anointed of the Lord. And so she's thinking he's going to lose his status and popularity with the people if he continues to act this way. But David actually believes the opposite. And as we can actually see from David's life and how he is revered, that the very things that she despised in David were the very things that made him a great and beloved king for the people of Israel. These are, this is what she's doing. And now, and David is trying to say, oh, I'm trying to please the Lord. I'm not trying to please people. And the author of the books of Samuel is very strategic. He, every time he, calls, he talks about her, he says, McCall, the daughter of Saul. He's not just trying to rhyme. He's trying to tell us something, that she is from the old regime. She is from an old way of thinking, an old way of viewing things, not the way of the Lord. 
And her accusations are a few things. First of all, that, he, that David improperly mixed himself with the people. Rather, he should be more aloof and inaccessible to the people because he's the king. Or two, that he was a religious show-off, that he was showing off and this wasn't a genuine response. And lastly, that he was more motivated by immoral sexual urges to promote himself to other women rather than the Lord. That's what, he, that's what she means by calling him a vulgar fellow. And now we can, we've been through the series of David. We just finished the story of David and Bathsheba. So we see that that accusation isn't completely without merit. David did some things that were not okay and showed that he had a problem with women. He had way too many wives than he was supposed to have. He took Bathsheba for himself. He was a very lustful man. But when we look at this story, if David had properly dressed himself in the priestly attire, there is no way that anything inappropriate would have been seen at that, at that time when he was dancing. There's no way. Because sometimes people say, oh, he's dancing in his underwear. He was not dancing in his underwear. He was dancing in a priestly garment to be humble. And so David's response is very clear. It's somewhat angry and cutting, but he's telling the truth. He says, I was chosen by God to be king. And, it's, and he views this in a humble way, you know, by the fact that he took off the royal clothes and wore the humble clothes of a priest. But he's saying, it was not your father's line or anybody from your family that gets to be king. This is not for you because Saul lost it because he did not have a heart after God. And secondly, David's saying, my audience is the Lord. He says, I will celebrate before the Lord. And because of this, he's willing to be undignified. He's willing to be humiliated for the glory of God because he has humbled himself, because he is a servant of God. And that he is not above groveling or having a humble mentality towards God. And so when she says, or when the, when the author says that McCall died childless, I think a couple, there's a couple different ways that we can see this. One, that even if David and her slept together from this point on, God was actually saying, nope, I have made you barren. You will not have any more children. Or what I actually think is more likely is that the marriage between the two of them was so strained at this point that David had no interest, no interest in sleeping with her and that no other man would dare to try and do this. And so this was actually sort of a, a finishing to kind of God's just punishment on Saul for the way he had acted as the king of Israel to make sure that there was no child that came from his daughter that could lay claim to the throne. And especially if he was, the son was born of David and her that could lay claim to the throne. And, we, and we'll see this next week how that causes David all kinds of problems later with his sons from other wives. And so God is acting out his final punishment and justice on this on the people of Saul and so this leads us to our last and final priority or approach is that we must have our priorities align with God's but Paul's priorities were with proper decorum royal dignity outward appearances and keeping up a certain image as royalty and so far so often we as humans can be so focused on things that are external rather than things that are internal. How we dress, the house we might own, the cars we drive, how successful our kids are, how many friends that we have, our GPAs that we have in school, the colleges we might get into, the jobs that we have, the salaries we make, the people that we might marry, all of that. We put it, and the list can go on and on and on. But our priority, first and foremost, as followers of Christ, is to know God and to make him known. That's our job. And any of those things actually can be used for the glory of God with that as our priority, to know God and make him known. But in and of themselves, they don't provide any meaning. And we must also seek to please God rather than men. Because when we accumulate these kind of things and focus on the external, and our priorities are on the things of this world, it becomes about showing off to other people. And that's not the heart that God desires for us. So when I think of this story, I think of a, of a moment in the Chronicles of Narnia books. If you're familiar with those, it's, it's about these four children called the Pevensey children. The, this, the first book is The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe, written by C.S. Lewis. 
And Lucy and two of, the, two of the Pevensey children, Lucy and Susan, are about to meet Aslan, the Christ figure, who is a lion for the very first time. And they're talking with these two beavers. This, if you haven't read these, this all might sound really crazy. But they're about to meet Aslan for the first time, and they're a little bit afraid. And so the beavers are trying to help them with this. They say, oh, said Susan, I thought he was a man. Is he quite safe? I shall feel rather nervous about meeting a lion. That you will, dearie, said Mrs. Beaver, and make no mistake, if there's anyone who can appear before Aslan without their knees knocking, they're either braver than most or else just silly. Then isn't he safe, said Lucy? Safe, said Mr. Beaver. Don't you hear what Mrs. Beaver tells you? Who said anything about safe? Of course he isn't safe, but he's good. He's the king, I tell you. And the beautiful imagery that C.S. Lewis is portraying to us there is, yes, God is an absolutely good and loving father. But that because he is a holy and just God, that he is not safe to approach unless we have believed in Jesus, unless we have come to believe in him today. Because it is only through faith in Jesus and his perfect sacrifice that washes us completely clean of our sin that allows for us to approach God. And so I would implore you today, if you have not come to Christ before, come to faith in Christ today. Because yes, God is a God of holiness and he is to be feared, but he is also the same God who sought to reconcile sinful humanity back to himself by becoming human, dying on the cross, taking our penalty for our sin and raising to life so that we could become the righteousness of God and approach him without any fear of death or punishment because our, our debt has been paid. What a beautiful description of a God that we serve. Maybe he's not safe, but he is good. And so we hold these two ideas in tension, to tremble before a holy God in reverence and awe for his perfect holiness and show him respect in the way that we worship and pray, but also that we approach him with great joy because he is a great God of mercy and love who has enabled us to fellowship with him through Jesus' death on the cross and our belief in him. And so we remember what we've talked about throughout this morning, that we must learn to approach God according to his word healthily fear his holiness, rejoice in his character, and align our priorities with his. Let's pray. God, we're just so thankful for this morning. We're thankful for the fact that you have enabled us by your grace to be able to stand before you, to approach you. And so, God, that you can make us clean, that we can have a relationship with you because you have, when we believe in you, you have washed us totally clean of our sins. So, God, help us to align our priorities with yours, rejoice in who you are, have a healthy respect for who you are, but, God, to seek to do things the way that you have laid out in your word. So, God, we thank you for this morning and pray this in your name. Amen.